Welcome to the SVG TV News for today, Tuesday, August 10th. I'm Khalil Cato with the details. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez said that opposition leader Dr. Godwin Friday did not follow basic protocols as a leader and failed all tests following last Thursday's incident in which he was struck in the head by a protester and as a result suffered a concussion. Speaking on radio on Sunday, PM Gonzalez said that an attempt was made on his life and he knows that the crowd was riled up by individuals which led to his injury and that the opposition leader did not do the acceptable thing which was to denounce the attempt on his life. I do not tolerate this kind of violence. Even though it might have been nothing but an opportunistic, holier than thou bit of hypocrisy. Since he had been involved in riling people, riling them up. But that's, that's at least the first test, which was before him. He didn't meet it, he didn't pass it. The second test is at the first opportunity in the house to have denounced what happened unequivocally in specific terms with absolutely no ambiguity or equivocation. Instead, his first response is that what happened was regrettable. In other words, my bloodshed was regrettable. And having done those first two things, and he failed to take those tests and meet them. PM Gonzalez said that the opposition leader did not call immediately or request to see him at the hospital, which was another failed test, noting that the former leader of the NDP, Sir James Mitchell, called him almost immediately. He should have then called Eloise and requested permission to come at the bedside of Ralph at the Milton Theatre Memorial Hospital. Mm -hmm. That also he failed to meet. When I was on the recovery room, James Mitchell called me on FaceTime, you know. Okay. And we had a long conversation. The Prime Minister also laid blame, laid some blame on the unions which took part in last Thursday's protest, noting that the van drivers who took part did not represent all drivers. If you, if you van drivers there don't represent the van drivers generally, and insofar as the leadership of the teachers' union and the public service union, their conduct was wholly reprehensible. They tried to piggyback on a political demonstration which has, which from the beginning has only one purpose, from Ashel all the way to get rid of Ralph and the government. And in response, opposition leader Dr. Godwin Friday said he rejects all attempts being made to blame him personally for the injury that the Prime Minister suffered. When I deny, I, I reject that. That is just absolutely um, scapegoating in an attempt to, you see, the perception, of course, is that I am the person who is the greatest political threat. So therefore, they would seek to damage my reputation and to smear me with these kinds of allegations, which are absolutely false. Everybody who has known me in my life in politics and even before then would know that I would never encourage, never advocate, never condone and would reject out of hand any act of violence against anybody, including Ralph Gonzalez. It doesn't advance the cause of the Democratic Party. It does not advance my cause. Why would I encourage it? So I categorically reject that. And anybody logically looking at it would know that that's the case. Prime Minister Gonzalez returned home yesterday afternoon from Barbados, where he was under observation after an MRI determined he suffered a concussion. 
At the Argyle International Airport, the Prime Minister, with his wife by his side, received a warm welcome home as he was greeted by some party supporters and cabinet members led by acting Prime Minister Montgomery Daniel. The Prime Minister left the airport in a motorcade-style procession, waving to pockets of, protest, of supporters sorry, along the way, heading to his residence at Old Montrose, where he is now in quarantine. Our news team spoke with some supporters who said they were happy to welcome their leader home. Welcome to my Prime Minister. Happy belated birthday to him and welcome back home, Prime Minister. We love you all the time. We'd always love you. No other Prime Minister like that, Prime Minister. Our Welcome to see him. I was very upset that they bust the Prime Minister. I'm glad to see him here again and I always, always love it. It's great that he is back. Uh, we proved it that he is hard to die. They tried to kill him. He had to die. They said it. The ULP's caretaker for the East Kingstown constituency, Luke Brown, was among the well-wishers at his Sign Hill office who were happy to see the PM back on island. And I'm also very, very happy to hear that there's a good medical report and that he didn't really sustain extensive damage as a result of the injury which befell him last week. Uh, I, I think that it is important for us to send a message that we are not a, a stone thrower in society and uh, that we do not uphold the kind of behavior that led us to this kind of position. I'm sure that the Prime Minister will come back stronger than ever. You know, he is a man who is known to use adversity as a stepping stone and because of his grit and determination he will continue to uphold all the principles of democracy in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and, and make sure that we have uh, civilized and constructive engagement. Uh, by and large Vincentians appreciate the work of his leadership as, as demonstrated over the past 20 or so years and he has some more juice in him and he has also planted the seeds of unity and labor in our hearts and I'm sure that that seed or those seeds will grow into a plant that is able to sustain St. Vincent and the Grenadines for many years to come. And Governor General Her Excellency Dame Susan Duggan in a statement issued on Monday expressed utter disappointment and dismay over the injury sustained by the Prime Minister during last Thursday's protest action in capital Kingstown. In the statement, the Governor General said while peaceful protests are expected and even welcome manifestations of a mature democracy, when a protest descends into anarchy and violence, that is when, as an enlightened society, we have to pause and take stock as to the direction in which we're heading. Her Excellency said we cannot say that this is our democratic and constitutional right to protest and at the same time condone any action which puts lives at risk and falls well outside the limits of the law. She appealed to all organizers of protests in the future to reflect on what took place last Thursday, August 5th, and to ensure that the necessary control mechanisms are always put in place to prevent a repetition of what took place. Her Excellency used the opportunity to wish the Prime Minister a speedy recovery and commiserates with his wife and entire family on the unfortunate incident. Two new positive COVID-19 cases were reported from 112 samples processed on Sunday, resulting in a positivity rate of 1.8%. The two cases are imported cases from St. Lucia and the United States. Five new positive cases were reported from 125 samples processed yesterday, resulting in a positivity rate of 4%. Two new recoveries were noted over the reporting period. 50 cases are currently active and 12 persons with COVID-19 have died. 2,306 cases of the virus and 2,244 recoveries have been recorded in St. Vincent and the Grenadines since March 2020. Health authorities say in view of the increased risk of infection with and subsequent transmission of COVID-19 posed by the growing incidence of variants in cons of concern in persons entering SVG, strict compliance with all protocols and recommendations including the effective use of masks, Physical distancing, hand sanitizing, and immunization with available vaccines is strongly recommended. 15-year-old Mark McDonald died on the spot yesterday after his motorcycle collided with a motor vehicle TB622 driven by 43-year-old landscaper Edward Joseph.
The accident took place in Belair on the road to the Mineral Spa near the bridge just after 3 p.m. On the scene yesterday, a neighbor, of, a neighbor of the family of the deceased described him as a polite child. He's a very, very nice child. He, he normally be by my house all the time. I lost him before he got here. He was by my house. Very, very nice child. Never rude or anything. The heartbroken woman said the motorcycle that the boy was riding belongs to her children and that they were all at home hours before the accident. As he left by me, this is what happened. He was going for a ride. He was left by me. My aunt, by, by my the bike, the, the bike there is my children and my My two sons' bike. Yeah, so that's not his bike. No, that's that, 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 my two sons' bike. The bike is my children and my but I don't know what happened here because I live up there and when I came I saw him under the truck. He was already died. But I don't know what 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 take place. More than I see him underneath the truck and his brother come up and tell me he ran under the truck and um he dead. So I told him he said dead, he said yes. So when I came down, I saw him underneath the truck. And a correction there, young McDonald was riding a bicycle and not a motorcycle at the time of the accident. This is the second fatal accident of the year. The first victim was also a Belair resident, Chavel Kane, who died on the spot at the that should be who died on the Mandela Highway on July 18th. Meanwhile, the body of a young man from Point Village in the North Windward constituency was fished out of the sea off the coast of Belen earlier today. The circumstances surrounding his death are unknown at this time. We will, however, bring to you more on this story in our next newscast. 66.63% of students met the standard in language arts, while 54.13% met the standard in mathematics for the national diagnostic tests taken recently by primary school students island-wide from grades 2 to 4. The results were given by Minister of Education Curtis King in Parliament last Thursday in his response to a question from opposition MP for the Southern Grenadines, Terence Oliver, on the assessment. Minister King told Parliament the assessment is to enhance the teaching and learning process in the school system. In language arts, grade 2, there was a 73.8% of the number of students who took that assessment who met the standard. The same percentage, just about 73.8% met the standards for the mathematics assessment in grade two. In grade three, the language arts, 66.27% met the standards. In grade three, for math, 56.56% met the standard. With regards to grade four language, 64.67% met the standard. Where mathematics is concerned, only 35.73% met the standard. Grade five language, 58.81% met the standard. And for grade five math, 52.09% met the standard. Minister King was also asked about the percentage of primary school students who were present for the examinations. He noted that 7,030 students were expected to be assessed and over 95% took part in the exercise. 7,035 primary school students were scheduled to sit the standardized assessment in language arts and mathematics. Of this total, 95 0.17% was present for the assessment. The breakdown by grade is as follows. Grade 2, there were 92.07% present. Grade 3, 94.75%. Sorry, I said grade four? Yes. Okay, so grade three, 94.75%.
grade four, 95.76 percent, and grade five, 98. The Education Minister said the in-depth analysis of the assessment is not yet completed by the Examination and Assessment Unit, and when this is done, it will be used to guide the Ministry of Education's Academic Recovery Program. We intend to put in place a comprehensive program to assist students who would have encountered learning loss during the period. Plans are already in place for a summer school program that will focus on students identified by their schools as having the greatest learning needs. Minister King noted that for the assessment, measures were put in place for the students to follow specific COVID-19 guidelines, but a COVID-19 test was not one of the requirements. The COVID-19 test was not a mandatory requirement for primary school students to sit the recently completed national tests. The Ministry of Education, on the advice of the Ministry of Health, encouraged parents to have their children tested so as to reduce the risk of students contracting or spreading the COVID-19 virus during the examination period. The total number of primary and secondary school students that took the test was 6,517. Unfortunately, the desegregated data are not yet available. Hence, I'm unable to provide the percentage of primary school students that took the test. The first of 224 cruise ships expected in SVG for the season docked at Port Elizabeth Beckway on Saturday, August 7th. The Seaborne Odyssey came ashore in Beckway carrying well below its capacity of 450 persons with just 81 passengers and approximately 200, 250 crew members on board as per COVID-19 social distancing requirements. In a telephone interview with SVG TV News on the start of the cruise season and the return of cruise ships to these shores since the pandemic, Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation, Sustainable Development and Culture, Carlos James, shared the details of the first cruise call and the experience that both the visitors and stakeholders have had with the bubble system currently in effect under the cruise line's COVID-19 protocols. He noted that the feedback has been positive. The we're quite pleased with the arrangement in which we um, were able to put in place as a result of our COVID-19 um, cruise protocols. Um, so far, the response has been quite um, welcoming, and we're looking forward to see a regular scheduled call of Seaborne Odyssey to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, they're hoping to be in Beckway almost every other week, and we can hopefully from this testing phase expand um, our um, existing bubble sites to other locations on Beckway and other locations in the Grenadines. And similarly, uh, as it relates to cruise calls to Port Kingston, we are hoping to um, see a number of calls, roughly 224 of them this year, and we're hoping to see um, more passengers come into uh, mainland as well as part of the, the COVID-19 um, cruise protocols in which we have put in place to receive vessels. Minister James said the Seaborne Odyssey's visit took place without any challenges, which he says, which he hopes that is, is maintained throughout the season. Um, we had no incidents in relation to the Seaborne Odyssey call to Beckway, and I'm hoping that we could continue um, using that model as a, as a perfect example of how, despite the challenges of COVID-19, we were able to, to bring ships to our destination, bring ships to our shores, and we were able to make tourism work. Um, despite the challenges. So I'm asking all of the stakeholders to let's work together, let's, let's rebuild stronger together, um, let's adhere to the protocol set in relation to um, cruise tourism, and let us ensure that we have a safe cruise season 2021-2022. The tourism minister said the plantation house in Beckway is one of the first properties on the islands to be designated a safe zone as other properties are being sought after, both in the Grenadines and on mainland St. Vincent, to expand the bubble. What we did was essentially identify um, the plantation house and, and, and as, as one of the, the very first bubble sites, um, mainly because of its proximity 
to the shoreline. It had um, we were able to identify um, a private um, access point from the tenders leaving the cruise ship straight onto um, the private dock at Plantation House. Um, we will identify other sites in in on Beckway. And of course, in, on, on mainland St. Vincent, we'll also identify and release the names of the other sites as, as the cruise season continues. Despite the tourism sector being unable to make a full turnaround with the COVID-19 pandemic and a low vaccination rate paving an uncertain path, Minister of Finance Camilo Gonzalez has noted that there is still some hope for the industry. With the island scheduled to receive some 224 calls to, to the various ports of entry for the current cruise season, the inaugural flight of Virgin Atlantic from the UK on October 13th and other airlines resuming flights to AIA, Minister Gonzalez said there are some indications that SVG may outperform its neighbors in the tourism sector for the remainder of the year. Starting in October, we'll be welcoming flights from the United Kingdom for the very first time in our history. With Virgin Atlantic commencing a weekly schedule beginning Wednesday the 13th of October, and it's a big plane, biggest plane ever to land on a scheduled flight in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's bigger than the AAs and the Air Canadas and the Caribbean Airlines that have been coming. So that'll be bringing up to 265 passengers each time for the rest of the year starting in October. The same Wednesday the 13th, American Airlines resumes its second weekly flight. A couple of weeks later, Air Canada resumes operations. And we're optimistic that Caribbean Airlines will also be resuming its New York run. So from a situation last year where you didn't have England, you had very reduced America, you had no Canada, you had no New York, all of those are coming back on stream this year. So that's a positive sign. The minister noted that in spite of the eruption of the La Soufrière volcano and the COVID-19 pandemic, Interest has not been lost in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as the island is still being considered the rising premier destination in the OECS. Minister Gonzalez detailed several reforming projects that will actualize in the next two years, including the first beaches resort in the OECS at Bocament Bay. Neither the pandemic nor the volcano have dampened medium-term interest in St. Vincent and the Grenadines or dampened the settled view that St. Vincent and the Grenadines is the rising hospitality destination in the region. On mainland St. Vincent, by 2023, so not next year, but year after, we will see the opening of a 350-room beaches resort, a 250-room Marriott resort, a 150-room Royal Mill resort, a 93-room Holiday Inn Express, and a boutique Hotel Myers Place um, in the Diamond area, among others. And based on already announced and in progress developments, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is slated to have the largest increase in hotel room stock in percentage terms anywhere in the region. The minister further noted that there are several exciting developments yet to be announced for the Grenadines, as well as collaborations between airlines to ensure that airlift is available to accommodate the demand when the hotel room stock is completed. He said an estimated 7% economic growth bounce back is predicted for SVG in 2022, based on the expected developments in the tourism sector. Meanwhile, the Minister of Finance says the outlook for the tourism sector is heavily dependent on the vaccination rate island-wide and, and that of other source markets. Tourism is expected to remain depressed and its prospects are strongly contingent on vaccination efforts locally and vaccination efforts in our source markets. And in our source markets, we're not doing badly. United States, United Kingdom, Canada, the European Union are all approaching what's called herd immunity. They're all north of 50%. Some of them, Canada, if you count first, and if you count those who are fully vaccinated and those who have had their first dose only, they're in excess of 70% already. Where are we? We are less than 
and that uncertainty about vaccinations, about new variants, about outbreaks, makes it very difficult to model what tourism is going to look like in St. Vincent and the Grenadines this year. The minister noted that the uncertainty on island is also reflected in the OECS, with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank having estimated figures ranging from half a million visitors to two million visitors expected for the region, which he said remains well below the five million visitors that are normally seen. This is signals another difficult year for the tourism industry locally and regionally. Tourism planner in the Ministry of Tourism, Raquel Hamlet, who was one of the panelists on day one of the recently concluded Virtual Tourism Stakeholders Conference, spoke on several upgrades being done to various tourism sites across the island, as well as the launching of initiatives to bolster yacht tourism. These initiatives, she said, are being done through the OECS Tourism Competitiveness Project, which has been underway for the past three years. Hamlet detailed the work currently taking place at several forts, Anchorage sites and at the and the new beach facilities at Villa. For Charlotte, as we know, and most of us would have had comments about the fact that when you go to Fort Charlotte, yes, it gives you a 360 degree of view of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. However, there isn't much to see. But coming out of this project, you there will be much to see. It would entail a business plan that would structure the management, operation, marketing, and commercialization of the fort. And the project would also entail restorative works to uh, the forts in Hamilton, Beckway, Rapid, and Irene in Union Island. Development upgrading of four Anchorage sites, and these are the areas that they, this would be done. This is a means of gaining revenue from um, Anchorage sites, and also as a means of protecting our, um, our marine ecosystem in a controlled way. Ongoing work on capital projects. Some of you may be aware that um, there is a new beach facility that is con being constructed as we speak at Vela Beach, and that's part of our capital project. A five-year master plan to guide the island's tourism sector is also currently in the works, according to Hamlet, who said a draft has already been prepared and is awaiting feedback. A significant component of the OECS project is the tourism sector plan or master plan. The sector plan, the objective is to have a, something that is strategic to guide the sustainable development of the industry for the next five years. Presently, uh, the cons there's already consultancy going on with regard to this. Um, actually, they have, first, they have recently presented their first draft of the master plan, and we are uh, expected to provide our feedback soonest. This is a very important plan, especially given what we have gone through the last two years or so. We, we look forward to the completion of this tourism master plan. The tourism planner also detailed plans for the yachting sector, which has seen a slight uptick in recent months. We have established a yachting committee, and these are the objectives here. That's the objective. It's already, we've already had several discussions with regard to that. And one of the primary objectives I want to emphasize here is to bridge the gap between private and public sector. Yes, we're saying that it's not public and private sector, but it is because, truthfully, there is a public sector and there is a private sector. How do we bridge that gap? How do we listen to their, have their issues addressed? So that yachting committee will give us the impetus to have those challenges addressed so that we can move forward sustainably. Sales in Vincent and the Grenadines is a new event that is being proposed and it is proposed and being worked on, on the, by the ministry. Um, we are looking at having this event in November and work is in progress in terms of having it um, synchronized. These are the objectives. We rejuvenate the tourism sector, stimulate socioeconomic activities and showcase the diversity of the destination tourism product offering.